to the second installment to the Introduction to Brewin Water video series. In this video I'm going to be talking about water hardness and alkalinity and what each one of those things are and how they are applied to your Brewin Water. I'm also going to talk about malt phosphates and talk about how they interact with your Brewin Water and help reduce the pH of your wort. And you remember in the last video I talked about had it ever seemed like you can brew one style of beer better than any others? So in this video I'm going to introduce the concept of residual alkalinity, talk about what it is specifically, and how that can be used to determine what beer style your water is best suited for. I'm also going to talk a little bit about how you can adjust your water so that you can target it for different styles of beer. So why should you care? Well. There's so many different things that can go wrong throughout your brew day, be it bad ingredients, a bad process, sanitation, fermentation temperatures, packaging, etc. Water makes up more than 90% of the beer, so it's something that you probably want to pay really close attention to and make sure that you get it right. If your pH is too high, then your, hop, your hops are likely to come across as uh, bitter or too astringent, all those precious hops that you put into it, they could come off being heavy and coarse. The malts are going to seem um, dull and lifeless. With a high pH, your beer could also come across as being sort of soapy and caustic. If the pH is too low, then the malts are probably going to seem more one-dimensional or narrow. The hops are not going to be well-defined, and there could be other off flavors. So what are the contributing factors that affect your brewing pH? Well, there's hardness and there's alkalinity. Hardness is mainly the levels of calcium and magnesium that you have in your brewing water. Alkalinity is mainly the level of carbonates that you have in your water that prevent the pH from being able to lower itself down into a range that you want for brewing water. Secondary taste factors are the levels of chlorides, sulfate, and sodium that you have in your brewing water. Now these things don't necessarily contribute to the change of the pH, but they do affect the flavor and mouthfeel of the water, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in this video. So getting to know your water. The two main things that you need to know about your water is its hardness and its alkalinity. Hardness, again, is just the calcium and the magnesium that's in your water. These things are usually reported as milligrams per liter or parts per million. They can also come up as being uh, parts per million as calcium carbonate or CaCO3. Alkalinity is almost often reported as calcium carbonate, um, CaCO3 on your water report. So let's go forward. Looking at the spectrum of hardness specifically, the levels of calcium and magnesium that you have in your water. Anything between 0 and 60 is considered very soft water. It's going to be low in minerals and more often than not being low in alkalinity as well. Anything between a spectrum of 60 and 120 is considered the sweet spot really for brewing because uh, you want levels of calcium in your brewing water between 50 and 150. So if you can get hardness that's between 60 and 120, have this sweet spot, your water is probably going to be fantastic for brewing and probably require minimal uh, adjustments. Anything higher than that, between 120 and 180 is considered hard water. It's likely to have high levels of minerals and have a higher alkalinity as well. Anything higher than 180 is probably not going to be good for brewing and you're going to want to use some water softeners, uh, use reverse osmosis, get the distilled water to brew with, uh, something like that. It, it's going to need to be treated in one way, shape, or form. Typical signs of hardness in your water, of course, is going to be the chalk-like substances that show up around your faucets. Um, also, if you find it hard to get really soapy bubbles from uh, whether it's dish soap or lathering up in the shower with a bar of soap, uh, if you don't get a good lather, then that's probably a good sign that you uh, have hard water. Um, and that's pretty much where the term comes from. Hard water is because it's hard to use to wash with. That's it. So here's a couple maps that I got for a very high level overview of hardness across the United States and the UK. 
Um, it's probably not going to be as granular as you're going to want it for understanding what your brewing water composition is, but it will give you a general sense if you're unable to find any other sources. I tried to find one for New Zealand, Australia, um, and across Europe, and I wasn't able to find any on the internet, but it doesn't mean that they don't exist, so go ahead and look for these in your area. So understanding the different forms of hardness. There's carbonate hardness and non-carbonate hardness. Carbonate hardness, otherwise known as alkalinity, is the thing that's in your water that prevents a change in the pH. It's when calcium and the magnesium ions have bonded with bicarbonate ions. This is considered temporary hardness because boiling it or you can use slaked lime in order to soften it. When you add hardness, it's going to form carbonate from the bicarbonate and precipitate out as calcium carbonate or otherwise known as chalk. Chalk really only dissolves in water when the water pH is 6 or higher. And that's why it's recommended to use bicarbonate in order to increase the alkalinity or the pH in your brewing water and not chalk. Non-carbonate species is when calcium and magnesium ions have bonded with other ions such as sulfides, chlorides, and nitrites. These are considered permanent hardness. And these are the ions that most react with the malt phosphates and contribute towards lowering your wort pH. Together these make up total hardness. A sign that you have some permanent hardness is when your water report reports higher hardness levels than alkalinity. If your water report contains alkalinity levels that are higher than your hardness, then most likely all the hardness is temporary hardness. If all you have on your water report is total hardness, I found an interesting little formula from the book New Brew and Lager Beer from Greg Noonan. He basically stated in that book that if all you have is total hardness, you can take total hardness, divide that by 1.25 to get your calcium level. For your magnesium level, take the total hardness and divide it by 5. And in that, you can basically deduce what your calcium level is and what your magnesium levels are. Now, I've used the Lamont Brew Kit here probably 8 or 9 times for different brewing water samples across different parts of Norway and Sweden. And what I've discovered is that for 6 out of 8 times, that formula stayed really true. Uh, it was really, really close to the values that I actually got for the water results. So I highly recommend using that formula if all you have is total hardness. So let's take a look at the properties of calcium and what are the benefits of using it in your brewing water. So in addition to contributing towards water hardness, did you know that adding it to plain old simple tap water will actually increase the water pH? The reason is because it's right there at the top of the slide is that it's an alkaline earth metal. And when it doesn't have any phosphates to react with, it will actually cause the water pH to rise. This is where there's a difference between just tap water and brewing water. The recommended range of calcium in your brewing waters, like I said, is between 50 and 150 parts per million. When it comes to the mash, well, here's where the calcium reacts with the, moss, the malt phosphates. It releases hydrogen ions and thereby lowering the pH, increasing the acidity. It not only helps with reducing the silicate and polyphenol extractions from the grain husks, it also helps promote enzyme activity and therefore increase in your mash efficiency. In the boil, having a healthy level of calcium helps with the protein coagulation, getting all that protein to clump together and sink to the bottom, and it helps to further reduce your pH. In fermentation, calcium levels help with keeping the yeast healthy, helps with yeast flocculation, and thereby making the resultant beer much more clear improve in the overall flavor, and keep the beer more stable over a period of time. Too much calcium, however, has its downsides. Calcium from gypsum can actually degrade the yeast's ability to absorb magnesium, and thereby decrease in the yeast's efficiency. So try and stay below the 150 parts per million. Now let's take a look at magnesium. Together with calcium, 
Magnesium plays a role in hardness as well. Recommended levels of magnesium in your brewing water is between 0 and 40 parts per million. In the mash, magnesium helps to lower the pH, but only about half as much as calcium does. And you should know that the malts that you add to your mash will already have a healthy dose of magnesium in them. So generally, you don't necessarily need to mag add magnesium at all. With regards to the boil, magnesium additions are normally only necessary when there's a lot of adjuncts that are used in the brew. When it comes to fermentation though, magnesium is important for the yeast's metabolism. But again, like I said, most of the magnesium that you're going to need is with the malt anyway. Words of warning, having more than 125 parts per million of magnesium can have a laxative effect um, for someone drinking the beer. So go ahead and steer clear um, of adding too much magnesium in your water. So let's go ahead and talk about residual alkalinity and what is it? Residual alkalinity is really just a term that's used to describe the relative levels between hardness and alkalinity in your brewing water. It's also a means to predict how the malts that you're using in your brewing water are going to affect your wort pH. Let's go ahead and take a look at the interactions between the malts and the brewing water. So the potassium phosphates from the malts interact with the ions that are in the water. Some elements bond to form CO2, while others bond to form calcium phosphates. And here's where it gets really interesting. The CO2 rises out of the solution, but the calcium phosphates precipitate and settle out. Another effect is that some of the hydrogen ions are disassociated and thereby contributing towards the acidification of the wort, therefore dropping the pH. Now, Paul Kolbach, a German brewing scientist who in the early 1950s discovered that it takes about 3.5 milliequivalents per liter of calcium to neutralize just 1 milliequivalent per liter of alkalinity. And then it takes about 7 milliequivalents per liter of magnesium to neutralize just 1 of alkalinity. This, as you'll soon see, gives way to make certain predictions about what your mash pH might be. It also gives you an idea about what beer style or what color of beer your water is best suited for brewing. The alkalinity that's left in the solution that wasn't neutralized, this is residual alkalinity. Okay, so this graph plots the results of applying Kohlbach's residual alkalinity formula to several different water sources around Europe. Here's his formula for figuring out residual alkalinity. It can be simplified by calculating what he called effective hardness. That's done by adding all of the calcium plus half of the magnesium. Then the residual alkalinity is determined by subtracting the effective hardness divided by 3.5 from the alkalinity. It's useful then to turn this around and say that the alkalinity is equal to the residual alkalinity plus the effective hardness divided by 3.5. Now we can use these to plot those values on the graph of alkalinity versus effective hardness. Now you can use this graph to compare brewing water to other well-known brewing cities. But notice that the thick red line there in the middle, that represents water composition with zero alkalinity. Paul Kohlbach based his experiments on adding pale malt in distilling water. And in doing so, he found that his mash pH, with no hardness or alkalinity, would fall between a pH of 5.5. By adding varying degrees of hardness and alkalinity to the distilled water, he was able to reasonably predict how much alkalinity remained in the wort, and based on that, able to predict the mash pH. Looking at Dormont, with a residual alkalinity of 5.5, which is higher than zero, you can see that the residual alkalinity levels higher than zero will raise the pH. Now looking at the similar profile where 
the residual alkalinity is minus 4.7, the mash pH is 5.36. And this demonstrates that the residual alkalinity less than zero will lower the pH. Finally, Paul Kulbach discovered another formula that based on his experiments could, using residual alkalinity, reasonably predict the pH shift. So it should come as no surprise that different types of malts contribute different levels of acidity. Base malts, for example, contribute the least amount of acidity and is the key reason why most light-colored beers require more hardness or acid additions to bring the pH down to a level that's good during the mash. Darker grains, such as crystal malts, contribute more acidity, but not nearly as much as roasted malts. Darker crystals, however, such as Special B and Crystal 120 or even Crystal 150, these contribute even more amounts of acidity than roasted grains. If your water is only slightly alkaline and doesn't provide enough alkalinity or buffering capacity that prevents the pH from dropping, then you can see how the wort pH could drop below an optimal mash level. This is where residual alkalinity helps you predict given your water profile and malts used, what the pH of the mash will be. In this image by A.J. DeLang, there are two immediate takeaways. Darker beers require more residual alkalinity than lighter beers. This ensures that there's enough buffering capacity keeping the pH in the desirable range. Increasing the alkalinity increases the residual alkalinity, while increasing the hardness or make use of acids will decrease the alkalinity and therefore the residual alkalinity. And also note, one more calculation. When you know your residual alkalinity value, you can use this formula to determine the best beer color that your water is suited for. This isn't the only tool though. In fact, there's a much easier way. Here's a nomograph that was created by John Palmer and introduced in his book, How to Brew. This is a great tool you can use to get a rough idea of both your residual alkalinity and a good visualization of the best beer color that your water is suited for. While it's pretty intuitive, allow me just to walk you through how this works. First, I found a water report for Madison, Wisconsin. Using this, I first want to plot the calcium and the magnesium levels using their parts per million or milligrams per liter values, not CaCO3. This will give me a good idea of the effective hardness as I draw a line between the two. And next, I want to plot the total alkalinity value. Now, the top half of this you'll see you have total alkalinity is calcium carbonate, or in the bottom part of the bar you can have HCO3. The choice is up to you. Then, simply draw a line from the effective hardness point up through the total alkalinity line and land on the residual alkalinity line. As you can see here, it lands very high on the scale. Although the calcium level is good, the magnesium is a little high. And with a residual alkalinity around 255 as calcium carbonate, this is way too high to brew with. According to this, a mash using this highly alkaline water is gonna result in a pH that is in excess of 0.3 points higher than one with zero alkalinity. Another obvious sign is that this water might brew an okay Imperial Russian stout, but a pale ale wouldn't stand a chance of tasting good with this water. This water definitely needs some adjustments. Let's look at another example. Here on my water report, it's very low in hardness and alkalinity and minerals. It's the quintessential soft water. Let's go ahead and plot this on the graph. First, my calcium is eight. Then my magnesium level is 2.4, which results in a fairly low effective hardness. Now I plot my total alkalinity as 40 parts per million as calcium carbonate, and then draw a line from the effective hardness up through the total alkalinity. Then I arrive at around plus 25 residual alkalinity. Now, while you might be thinking, hey, Tony, this isn't too bad. You can brew pretty good amber or brown ales with this water. But there's something else to think about here. 
Do you see it? Right. It's the level of calcium that's very low. And if I use this water untreated, I will not likely get all of the benefits that calcium contributes to the mash, fermentation, and the final product. So let's go ahead and add some calcium and see where that leads me. Okay, so now I've bumped up the calcium, and now I get a residual alkalinity close to zero. In addition to that, I can see that on the graph, that might be water that's better suited for light beers than pale ales or IPAs. So that's pretty cool. If I take the calcium even higher, I lower the residual alkalinity even more. And now you can see that my grain bill in that color ranges is likely going to lower a pH a little bit too. So that's great. Now I'm concerned with balance because calcium doesn't come for free. Every single salt addition added to is a double-edged sword, but I'll get to that in a minute. Balance. So pH is the most important detail during the mashing process and this sets the stage for the rest of the beer's life cycle. It's not the sulfate to chloride ratio or whether or not you have enough sea salt for your goza. Those things don't affect the mash pH and are really secondary considerations at this point. pH influences how the beer's flavors are expressed on the palate and therefore it's paramount that you get it right during the mash more than anywhere else at this point. A quick side note here is that for extract brewers that don't have the very softest of waters, you really need to use distilled or reverse osmosis water to rehydrate your extract. Do that and you'll almost certainly make a better taste in beer. Okay, so balance. Get the mash pH correct and you'll have come at least 80% of the way towards making a better beer. The only thing left now to think about is clean and sanitization and having a good fermentation and proper temperature control. If your pH is too low, the malts are not going to have any depth. The hops are not going to seem very present, so you want to get this right. So it's pretty common knowledge that having a higher pH in the boil will lead to better hop utilization. But again, this can lead to a beer that's really bitter and even astringent. And with a high pH, your malts will seem somewhat blah and lifeless. Have you ever had a beer tasting soapy? This too is most likely because the beer's final pH was way too high. So as you can see, finding and hitting the sweet spot of a pH for a different beer color and style is both a science and an art of truly great beer. Like safety, third thing's third. So I often hear people talk about brewing salts and understand that there's a lot of confusion about the chemistry. Just the word chemistry sort of puts people sort of in a um, sort of dumb state of mind. Or maybe that was just me earlier on. Either way, I want to take a few minutes and try and demystify brewing salt as a whole and hope to clarify when they should be used and for what purpose. So here I've categorized six brewing ions into two parts, hardness and alkalinity. So let's go ahead and look at the six most common brewing salts used to change water profiles and ultimately your beer flavor. First on the left is calcium sulfate, which is also commonly referred to as gypsum. This salt serves two purposes. It supplies calcium to the mash to lower the pH, and it also supplies sulfate to increase the perceived dryness and crispness of a beer. It also accentuates the hops. Beside that is calcium chloride, which among other things is used as a preservative in snacks and sporting drinks. This brewing salt contributes calcium as well, but also chloride to round out the beer's flavor, makes it seem fuller, and also accentuates the malts. Next is magnesium sulfate, which is commonly referred to as Epsom salt, and has several health benefits that are used in several medical treatments. Next is sodium chloride, otherwise referred to as rock salt or table salt. This is used as a food preservative and helps facilitate many important bodily functions. So while this salt complements the chloride aspect of a beer, it's malty fullness, it's the sodium ion you want to be cautious about. There's only a handful of beers that desire the flavors that contribute by this type of salt. 
Next is sodium bicarbonate, which most folks know is baking soda. This is by far the best salt to use to raise your mash pH and your alkalinity. And finally is calcium hydroxide, otherwise commonly referred to as lime, picklin lime, or slaked lime. This salt can serve two purposes. One, it can be used to soften very hard water with high levels of alkalinity, but it can also be used to increase the levels of alkalinity. The key difference between these two functions is highly technical with respect to the chemical reactions that occur at different pH levels, so I'm not going to get into too much detail about that here and now. I mention it here just because when it comes to brewing water during the mash, it can be used as a complement to sodium bicarbonate and help the increase the alkalinity when brewing darker beers with soft water. Now let's draw a few lines and review which salts contribute towards the two different groups at the bottom of the screen. Calcium can come from calcium sulfate, calcium chloride, and calcium hydroxide. Magnesium can come from the magnesium sulfate. Sodium can come from sodium chloride and sodium bicarbonate. Sulfate can come from calcium sulfate or magnesium sulfate. Chloride can come from calcium chloride or sodium chloride. And carbonates can come from bicarbonate or calcium hydroxide. As you see, each salt contributes two sides of the hardness and alkalinity line. Another takeaway from this view is that whenever you add one type of salt to your brewing water, you're consequently adding another one as well. And not knowing which characteristics each contributes to the beer can have severe consequences in the end. However, now knowing what characteristics each one contributes to a beer will bring you that much closer to brewing your best beer. So I'll end with this note about salts that I've not mentioned. You can of course use any one of these to complement the desired ion, be it for hardness, alkalinity, or flavor. But I've come to believe that these are not necessary for adding to my brewing water. Coming back to balance, here's a view that shows you where the key brewing salts come into play. For hardness and alkalinity and pH, Use calcium and magnesium for maximizing the benefits towards the mash, the boil, and fermentation, as well as long-term stability. When you need to lower the pH even further than the malts will do for you, just go ahead and use phosphoric acid or lactic acid. To increase the pH and alkalinity, use sodium bicarbonate. Use of chalk at this pH range we're brewing at will just precipitate out of solution. Baking soda is just much more effective, and you can also use calcium hydroxide to increase the alkalinity. Here's a list of recommended alkalinity ranges based on beer color. Okay, so now let's look at flavor. Use sulfate to get a crisp, dry beer that accentuates the hops. Use chloride to gain that smooth, fuller mouthfeel and accentuate the malt backbone. Recommended sulfate to chloride ratios are about 2 to 1 for bitter, hoppy beers, 1 to 1 or 1 to 2 for balanced beers, and 1 to 3 for malty ales such as porters and stouts. So when to add the salts? This is where things start to get a little bit complicated because it really depends on your brewing setup and preference. I believe this again is where the science and art converge to give us that brewers the opportunity to express our creativeness. Do I add the salts to the mash tun? Do I add them to the HLT? Or do I add them directly into the boil kettle afterwards? This really depends on your setup and your preferences. For example, if you have all of your water in one big container at the beginning of your brew day, and that's going to contain all the water that you need for your entire brew, you can go ahead and add in the salt additions to that, get that water composition that you're targeting, and then use that for both the strike and the sparge, and that basically ultimately is all the water that you need. 
For me though, I have a different preference because I like to take the water straight out of the HLT, use that to strike the mash, then I'll add my salt to the mash, then I check the pH you know, about after 10 minutes, and then make any more adjustments that I need to. If I need to lower the pH at that point, I'll use acid. Um, if I need to raise the pH, then I'll use bicarbonate. Some people prefer to hold back and add calcium or the chloride directly to the boil kettle. And that's perfectly fine too. Um, the main point really is to try whatever works for you. Some people discover that they like to do it one way or another. Again, it's really all about personal preference, but there is some chemistry there to be aware of in terms of the pH. So that's it for now. I've stressed the idea that water chemistry is mainly about getting your mash pH correct. Do that and you're well on your way to brewing a successful beer. Key salts for dialing in your mash pH are calcium and magnesium, as well as using acid to lower that pH if you need to. Using bicarbonate in order to increase your pH or alkalinity. And remember that the sulfate to chloride ratio is more about swinging the balance of the flavor of that beer according to the beer styles guidelines. In the next video or series of videos, I'll walk through the different tools and show you using your water profile, how to apply the concepts to dial in the recommended water profiles for the different styles of beers that you wanna brew. So thanks for watching and as always, feel free to leave comments down below. Uh, feel free to go ahead and ask any questions that you might have and let me know how this topic resonates with you. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Cheers.